Well, Dale, here we are wrapping up another series, the King's Seat series. Welcome. Are you ready for it? So many questions. <laughs> <laughs> Put you on edge. I, I, shouldn't, uh, yeah, I shouldn't treat you that you know, way. On the spot right away. I've, I've enjoyed this series. I, I've, I enjoy getting the opportunity to sit down and uh, kind of flesh out uh, and, and look into your, what you've written and, and kind of delineate some things because uh, you think on a different level. And, and uh, uh, you've been trained up in the way you should go. And uh, the fact is that what you do in life is an affirmation of that, that calling. And uh, I am blessed to be a part of the conversation and in that blessing, I am blessed uh, to be made better. And so I thank you for, for what you share. I thank you that you're engaged. We are blessed to have this kind of discussion before we tape in a class full of people mm -hmm. where we're getting interaction. And the fact that I have different ideas really is pretty meaningless to me unless it has good application. So to take these concepts and to see them lived out in people and changing lives, that's, that's amazing. It, it, it is amazing, and, and I don't know if, you've, uh, if it is apparent to anybody else, but these are some of my favorite parts of the week that uh, I get to come and be within a group of people that are trying to get better. And uh, I have varying degrees of uh, success at it, and yet uh, some have returned enough and, and turned their lives around. And, and I, don't, I give them credit for uh, sticking with it, uh, and I pray that they continue to stick with it. Well, today we've titled the, the section A Hidden Gift, and it's an interesting segue because you're talking about having just come out of a group of people who know they need to get better. They're struggling with addiction. Well, in the king's seat, it's actually just the opposite. Right. We talked about in the first segment in this series that the kings don't even know that they have pain. Why, they're the judges. They're they're the knowledge people. They're the competency people. They're the caregivers. They're the justice people. They're the ones who sit in the king's seat, so they don't have pain. They, they don't need to forgive. They don't need to let go. Why, I'm a knowledge person. I'm judging you. If you would just listen to me, you would start getting better, and, and they hide behind the king's seat. And while they're hiding in that place, they're not even recognizing that their pain has, is there, and, and they've turned into a critical zone, and that critical is because, whoa, people aren't listening to me, and I was created for people to listen to me. And so there's kind of a pain there because I'm not fulfilling the call of God on my life, and everything that I just said is subconscious. They're not even aware of it. It's hidden from them because they don't even know that they need to grow or step into a different place. Was that highly convoluted and hard to respond no, to? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm led to a place. I'm always right. Uh, that's the point of view, the perspective the king has, because he's the king. I mean, he rules over everything, everybody, and, and uh, what he says goes. And, and to, <laughs> I, I can't imagine coming face to face with that in, in, in the real world where uh, someone is sitting in the king's seat and, and to realize that, first of all, not everybody agrees with me because that's almost a given that, uh, that he anticipates, she, uh, the queen, if being that way, uh, anticipates that whatever they say is, is the best. And to come in, in, into the realization that somebody disagrees, that's got to be a stunner, and then uh, disagrees to the point of actually publicly 
facing up to the king and saying, no, that's not right. Uh, that's got to be a huge blow. And so much of the time, that's where they're living. They're living in a world of unreality, and it's hiding behind the knowledge and competency. And again, people who are there, they believe that they're right. And because they believe that they're right, and this is just truth, this is just facts, and you just need to grow up, and you need to get over it. And so there's a sense of feeling justified. They don't understand that pain has been pulling itself into that location, and there's a letting go that needs to happen. Well, if they don't even understand that it needs to happen, then they're not ready to receive. And then let's take it one more step. If God wants to pour it out on them, if he pours it out directly, it's not a whole lot different than if I approach the king and I try to tell him something. So it's almost like God has to come in the back door and provide a hidden gift in order for them to actually let go and to get better. can't remember if it's a song or a story, but there's a story about the king uh, that uh, uh, went naked and, and declared that that was the, that was the norm. And, and finally someone <laughs> said, no, wait a minute. <laughs> That, that's an extreme uh, ob uh, example. The emperor has no clothes. Exactly. There you go. Uh, it's, it's, it's a humorous story, but it's dead serious for the king because he's, he's made this decree, and <laughs> somebody's got the, the uh, huspada to say no. I asked the question a little bit earlier, is this convoluted? Let's, let's get down to specifics. You have a knowledge and competency person. What's the normal response? I'm just sharing knowledge with you. For if, your good. For your good. And so if you would just listen to me, things would get better. The pain comes out of there's a sense that I need people to listen to me so that I'm validated, so that I feel good. So when people are ignoring me, blowing me off, there's a pain that develops in there. The first part of that, obviously, is acknowledging that pain, because once that pain happens, then I become sarcastic, I become critical, I become a lot of different things, my message changes, the very purpose that I was created for is no longer functioning. So I get to that point, and I understand that I need to receive. Now, here's what's hard for them. They want to receive it in the same way that they're giving it. So they're like, okay, God, I'm going to go to your word and I'm going to study your word and you're going to give me this incredible piece of information. And then when you give me this information, I'm, I'm good to go. Well, that's not how it's going to work. And I say this over and over and over again. We see, we think, we feel from inside of our spiritual flows. So once a person who's in that knowledge competency zone has gone into a place of judging others, it's virtually impossible for them to think different thoughts. Even with the Bible, if they're reading the Bible, unless the Holy Spirit interjects and really begins to work on them, they're going to think inside of where they are spiritually, so they're even going to read the scriptures in a way that validates who they are, where they are, and what they're saying, and they will be completely incapable of receiving from God. So the information is important, but without implementation, uh, it's of, of no use. It takes just a tiny skewer, and, and I go back to my debate years. I use the same pieces of evidence arguing for a case <laughs> and against a case. Right. I mean, when you understand how quickly and easily you can twist logic and then take that and think about how quick we are to rationalize and how, how strong our egos are. And so I've got a knowledge and competency person for me to be able to take anything someone else says and twist it just enough so that now I'm back in control and my thoughts are actually right. And you're foolish for even approaching me and trying to tell me that I'm wrong. I mean, that just happens so quickly and so easily. And it even happens with the Word of God. It's interesting that you're, uh, we're talking about the king's seat, 
the person that's in charge, the leader, the uh, the director, point us in the direction. Uh, what I heard you saying in that was that even <laughs> on the other end of the scale, uh, as a pauper, I can go to the same place that the king is. Uh, and uh, the good news for the pauper is it might be a little bit easier to see uh, that tendency uh, than the king. The king, is, it's so difficult because he's not used to being challenged at all. What's interesting, we're talking spiritual terms. I've seen a lot of paupers, I've seen a lot of poor people who had nothing, who had no success, but, they're, but their spiritual gifts were that of a teacher. So they were knowledge people, they were competency people, and they literally had failure all of their life. Some of the proudest people that are around are poor people who have failed. And so that pride is still just a protective covering. It doesn't matter if you actually sit in the king's seat or you sit in the pauper's seat. If you're a knowledge and competency person, if there's this value center in here, people live inside of their spiritual flows where they see, where they think they feel inside of those. So I can be totally poor, have failed over and over and over again. Some of those people are the quickest to go into pride zones, are the quickest to go into protective zones. So that's an important point. When we're talking king seed here, we're not talking a person who is actually elevated and who is sitting in that place of influence. Some of the most poor, broken people can go exactly where I'm talking about. The expression in my mind comes to my mind because uh, basically that's, we all do that somewhere along the line where in my mind I have this perception and, and I, I like that perception of myself so much I act from that perce perception and that's true in life. We, we, I, uh, what comes out, what's your expression? What flows through you sticks to you? That's the one. Uh, we we have a take on life. Each of us has a take on life, good, bad, indifferent. <laughs> but that's where we operate from. That's where our our thinking is based, and that's when we the things we project uh, are projected from that appreciation or lack of it. Again, I'm talking about the hidden gift, a hidden gift. The knowledge and competency person would expect God to give him a word. He would expect to read and to study and to understand and to come to a different place. Actually, how a person knows if their knowledge and competency, sitting in the king's seat in that area, how a person knows that God has moved is something completely different. When a king begins to have compassion for other people, then he knows that, all right, I have been doing some receiving. God may have come in the back door. He may have actually given me a vision, given me a heart, given, given me some understanding. Now, let me jump to the Sermon on the Mount for just a moment. When you start through all of the different things in the Sermon on the, on the Mount over and over again, what God is saying is, give this to me, get your own heart right first. Get your own heart right first, then this thing will work. Get your own heart right first, then this thing will work. Well, let's take that to where we're talking about here. The person in the knowledge and competency place wants to go to the Bible, study, get an understanding, apply that understanding, and then step back into the scholarly seat. If he does that, he will stay in the place of critical spirit and judgment, and he will put people off destroy the message, and he's gained absolutely nothing. But on the other hand, when he begins to see real-life people in different ways and his heart begins to be softened and there's a compassion there, literally everything changes for him. So what's crazy in this thing, when the king is actually seeking that word, they're seeking to receive from God, they won't because they're in a pride zone. But when they allow God to humble them and they begin to see other people for who they are, that's the, that's the evidence that God has shown up and you're beginning to receive. So at the close of 
today's session, group session, I offered that there there were two things, probably more, uh, to consider and to give consideration. And and what you've just described there, what the king does with that moment of if if he goes to the word and reads it and and sees there's a need, he's considering it. Now whether he gives consideration out of what he's considered uh, is a step beyond that initial. Okay, there's something wrong here, and and it would seem in in the best of situations a king would say, oh maybe I can receive some some uh, wisdom from God and on how to do that. That's great. That's that's the necessary uh, person. In, in the seat with God, and then there's the application that comes along. If if I don't apply that that wisdom that I've been given and give it away, uh, I've I've missed the point. How does the king get to the place to where he actually has that consideration, gives that consideration? And the answer that I would give is he actually needs heart change. Now, you have a problem because he doesn't know that he needs heart change. He thinks he's superior. He He thinks he has better information. And many times, this is what I'm talking about. God has to come in the back door. He has to come in in a hidden way. When we talked about receiving in the Let It Go series and the process of how it happens, you've got this person who's broken and they're wounded. And so they come to God and they're crying out to God and they they look at the cross and they see that Jesus died for their forgiveness and for their freedom and their healing. And there's a very direct receiving process. That doesn't happen much with the king. Most of the time with the king, it's kind of like, well, is there even a problem here? What has to happen with the king, God has to come in the back door. And sometimes it is through maybe there's God gives them a bit of a vision and they start seeing the other person differently. Or there somehow there's just something that caused them to think differently about the other person. But the answer that I'm saying is compassion. When that person starts to have a heart of compassion, get your own heart right first. When the king starts to have a heart of compassion, hopefully, maybe you have to listen to this series first, but no, hopefully he begins to wake up and realize, wait a minute, I'm in a different place. God has been at work in me. They're humbled. Uh, That's necessary. There isn't going to be any progress until they have some humility. Now, most of this is backdoor, but the king can change that if he starts to recognize his critical spirit, if he starts to recognize his judgment, he starts to recognize that he's depending on knowledge in a way that he shouldn't depend. And so now I'm in the good flesh, a term that we talk a lot about, where I'm trying to use my gift instead of looking to God and depending on God, The king can speed this process up if he understands those things, he repents of that, gets back to a place of humility, and asks God for the compassion. He can actively cooperate with this process and make it happen. Unfortunately, what I see most of the time, it doesn't work that way. They don't even recognize they're there, and God has to kind of slide in the back door in a hidden way, provide a hidden gift to where all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow, maybe I was being harsh on this guy. Maybe I do need to think differently. Maybe I could learn something. And all of a sudden, the maybes become a reality to where the the king is like, oh, I do need to change here. I do need receiving. All you have to do is go to the Old Testament to find this. Uh, Father and son, generations uh, that that acted uh, as kings act that they are superior that the 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 word their word is the law and uh, all you can do is obey or something else but then the son comes along one of the sons uh, and and it's back and forth back and forth 
uh, obviously, this is a tough lesson to learn. It is a hard lesson, and kings sit in that king's seat because they don't see their need. They don't humble themselves, and so the only way God can get in is through that hidden channel. When we stop that process and we understand this information I've been talking about in the king's seat in this whole series, and we actively cooperate with God, we can speed that up. And again, I think, I see, I feel inside of my spiritual flows, when I'm in a heart of compassion, then I can even read the Word differently. I can even begin to directly digest this thing, and I get to a better place. Way too many people in Christ have lived in that intellectual zone, don't have the heart of compassion, and there's a level of blindness that they don't even realize is there. Well, it's been an interesting intro segment. Uh, I want to stop, ask a few questions, and then we will continue. We had we had a sermon on, and about the different kings, and uh, it's it's a fascinating progression, you know that, uh, and even within kings, realizing, and and uh, and making a change, and then going back, or the, it's just fascinating to, and then in the end. God says, enough, <laughs> I've seen enough, and, and <laughs> they, may, the, the, they make an alliance with the, their, their enemy nation, and, and so he sends in the worst of the worst to, to, to uh, change the whole picture. Isn't it interesting God had to choose Babylon, mm -hmm. the worst of the worst, to discipline the nation Israel, because they had fallen away from God, and the only way that he could get their attention was through another nation. Yeah, that is interesting. What does that make you think? With kings, many times the only way you can get their attention is through a calamity, through some kind of major happening, some kind of a crisis where all of a sudden they lose faith in their own ability and they begin to understand Oh, wow, I'm not quite, you know, too big for my britches, the, the old phrase. I'm, I'm not quite as great as I thought I was. Uh, maybe I need to develop some humility. So for a king like that, uh, death would be much easier than to be dethroned. And, and that's an interesting picture. And, and there are a lot of things, I believe, in our lives that that's kind of how we think about it. I'd rather die than than be exposed for thinking and living like that. Today in class, I brought up this point, that your pain is proportional to your pride. So kings do tend to have a lot of pride, so any level of rebuke, any level of correction is incredibly painful, so they, they're going to respond badly to it, which means that the people around them are slow to bring it, which means that you better hope they have their act together because they're not going to get much correction, and this thing could go downhill very fast. <laughs> and does. And does. <laughs> yeah. it, it really does. And they live in this world where they really don't see, don't know, don't want to understand. Now, of all the types that we talked about, we talked about caregivers. Caregivers are exactly that. They get into this world, they feel an instinctive sense of being mom, of being dad, and of being the adult in the room, and they're the one who is supposed to guide, and so we're no longer in the knowledge place. The big trait of the caregiver is loyalty. You're my child, you're part of my family, so you should be loyal to me. So then they get into a control place. And the control kind of takes over in the last segment, we talked about knowledge and competency people where information and, and reading the word and study takes over. Well, now we're into a place where loyalty is the high piece. And because loyalty is the high piece of you need to do what I say and you need to be responding there. And again, if you've got a mother with a child, if you've got a father with a child, 
especially young children, that's how you parent with extremely young children. You're teaching them to come under covering. You're teaching them to begin to respond to authority and, and how important that is. There's a place for that. But when I'm a caregiver and I'm expecting people to respond to me that way, again, I'm sending a very terrible message for most people. They're going to receive that badly. Then it breaks down. Then there's pain because I'm being rejected. I'm not being listened to. Uh, my gift isn't being valued, and I've got pain there. Again, many times they do acknowledge it, don't. Actually, caregivers are a little quicker to acknowledge that than, than the knowledge and competency people are, but, but there's still that hidden piece of, no, I'm mom, I'm dad, why aren't you listening to me? And there tends to be a doubling down in the control area. So the big picture is out of focus. Uh, the, we, we have this tendency to to think of ourselves in the, in the best light. Uh, what I have to offer is of, of value, it's of worth. And I think we all have a little bit of that. I think that uh, there are different degrees. But, but the way it's received uh, is huge. Uh, if, we, if we, again, I'm back to consider and consideration. If I can't step back and consider what the other person is, is experiencing, then, then more than likely I'm offending that person or any number of people with, with what I choose to do or say. Well, in the last segment, I talked about compassion. When you've got a knowledge and competency person and all of a sudden they start feeling compassion for the people around them, <laughs> well, God has moved. Yeah, we, we know something's happened. The same sort of thing is here with a caregiver, except let's choose a different word. And the word that I'm going to choose here is patience. Caregivers tend to believe in that vertical channel. I'm in charge. You should be loyal to me. You should snap too. When I, when I snap my fingers, and you, now. you should jump. And the only question should be how high uh, or where or something like that. A huge word is this word of patience, where I really start to understand who you are, how you tick. I've got the compassion piece, and so that's also important, but I'm going to add this patience piece where I see you for who you are. I'm not expecting you to respond to me. I'm not demanding that you respond to me. I know that may take time. It may take a process. So I'm willing to slow this thing down and allow it to play out where you've got free will, and free will is just flat slow. It's slow to come around, and that's why I think the patience word is so big here. And, and free will, what are we talking about? It's, it's my choice, and, and so I'm a little slow here. <laughs> well, I, 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 have, I have trouble with that. In your description of, of being patient, uh, the thing that got louder and louder was that's what God does with us. And yet we shake our fist at him because he doesn't operate now, now and when we want it. Uh, but if he did, we'd be in big trouble. Caregivers are more vertical. They expect a response. Are you ready? Now. Yeah, absolutely. I want it now. Did you hear me? And of course, you get into parenting style. Okay, I'll count. And you better be there by the time I get to three. You know, so, so that. And the, then you slow the count down because and, it's not getting there. And, and it's still not working. <laughs> but time is of the essence, and there's a sense of importance, and there's a sense of I'm in charge and I'm, I'm leading. And if you don't respond to me in the moment, I'm going to control you and I'm going to manipulate. And caregivers, Again, they get lost in their blindness. They don't understand this heart-to-heart -heart message that needs to be going on. So I'm not considering you. I'm not being patient with you. When the picture changes and the caregiver is able to step back and release, they're able to let go. They're able to let go of the control in a way that there's just a new kind of patience, again, in a hidden way not generally in an open way, an overt way, but in a hidden way, God snuck in underneath and he handed them a gift of patience. They've been doing some receiving, and if they take credit for that receiving to themselves, 
then it's not going to get better. They'll just go back into their arrogance zone. But when patience shows up, real, genuine patience, especially as kings, we need to understand, wait a minute, God has been at work. So you, you suggest that they have a sensation of being touched, that something's different. The big question is, what do you do with different? You know, where do you go from here? And, and, and I think that that's, that's the hard part for all of us, that when we recognize a shortcoming that we have that affects our relationships with others, are we willing to address it? Are we willing to look into it and seek some sort of change? A key part of receiving is acknowledging. You go back to Romans 1 where I talked about you need to recognize that God is God, and then you need to be thankful. So when a person who's a caregiver, that patience begins to wake up, and all of a sudden, I'm no longer demanding to be God in your life. That's, that's when the caregiver really becomes unhealthy. But I'm able to step back, and I'm able to allow you that free will. I'm able to allow you the space to make choices. And when you're making those choices, I'm not getting offended. God has been at work. Now, let's flip it back the way we did in the last segment. For the caregiver to do this in cooperation with God, actively seeking God, is for him to begin to realize the manipulation and the control that he's likely to step into. For him also to understand the level of blindness that he has. Caregivers, invariably, they're able to justify their own behaviors and be critical of other people's behaviors. Sometimes I call it rose-colored glasses. They put on one set of glasses for themselves, and they see themselves through one lens, and they put on another set of glasses for everybody else. So they're slow to recognize that they even need God, that they even need change. So when a caregiver begins to recognize these tendencies in himself and learns that Wow, when I'm being impatient, when I'm being controlling, I've stepped into a sick place, a bad place, and there's genuine repentance there, and that repentance carries it to God. Now I'm in a place where I can directly receive, and God doesn't just do the hidden gift thing where, oh, wow, I had patience today. I must really be growing. No, not so much. God was at work. So it's a, a progression, and, and it begins with. I see something different uh, in myself. And, and the, the best response for that is to recognize where it comes from and give thanks. And in that process, then the back door doesn't need to be, the approach can be more f front door, and, and uh, we begin to be receptive to God in a way that we haven't been before. And in that process, he's able to mold us, to, to, to direct us, and we have the potential to come uh, out of that selfish uh, perspective and be of use to others. What's interesting is that many caregivers actually end up being rescuers, or another word that I like to throw out is codependence, because your rescuers, your codependents, they see themselves as coming along in a way of being an influencer. And they see that role, and it's hard to see anything negative in it. After all, I'm a caregiver. I'm laying my life down for these people. They don't understand that they're running over free will. They don't understand they've stepped into a controlling place. They don't understand they've stepped into a place where they need other people. When these people wake up to these kinds of things and start letting go of all of that, that's an important process. Then they can actively receive from God in a way that they build patience towards other people. And once that patience shows up, again, it's not like a direct receiving thing from God. Back to the woundedness people, I go and I meditate on the cross and I'm like, oh, wow, look at what God did. And I have a peace now and there's a rest and a healing. I understand at that point that I just received from God. The king seat person, not so much, which again, it's a real negative because if, if the receiving is indirect and it hasn't been dramatic, 
then I'm going to still sit in the king's seat because look at what I have did, and I'm not going to give credit to God the way I need to get cre- give credit to God. That's why it's a hidden gift. That's why it comes in from the back door, from the other side. The, the big problem with kings is beginning to realize, oh, I do have pain, and I do need to receive from God. I'm reminded of uh, the expression, you have a firm grasp of the obvious. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not saying that to you. I'm What you just shared, it's how we misuse and abuse uh, the messages that we receive from God. Uh, that, yeah, I got it now, and it's all about me again. And, and uh, uh, we missed it, just absolutely missed it. When someone's a caregiver, when someone's a codependent, they miss what's obvious to everybody around them except them. And yes, it is the master of the obvious. It's, it's you know, I mean, what, what you're saying is actually correct. Everyone else can see your need for God. Everyone else can see your need for humility. But as a king, it's easy, and I'm going to include myself in this, it's easy for me to be blind to that. We need to receive from God. Well, let's take a break, and we'll have one more segment as we wrap up this King Seat series. Well, we are about to wrap this series up. It's part of the bigger Let It Go series because when I start to understand the Let It Go process, when I recognize my own stuff and I get it handed off to God and then I receive, that's the process of forgiveness. That's the process of healing, of pain and wounds. That's the process of growth. It's the process that happens so much with God. So We did an entire series that talked about that process, but in this series, in the King's Seat series, we're taking that process and applying it to kings, and kings don't necessarily feel like they fit that process because they're in a different world, and we've spent a lot of time talking about that today. And there are people operating in the King's Seat that don't even realize they're a king or think they're their king. Well, you brought it up earlier. There are paupers. There are poor people. There are people who see themselves as nothing and have nothing, but there's still a lot of pride there, and they've got a lot of different pieces going on. And let's talk about one other category that we talked about when I defined the kings, and that's I call them justice people. These are people who need to see a response from the other person. Until I see that you've repented, until you've paid restitution, until you've paid some kind of a price, I can't forgive you. And that's, that's back to the whole forgiveness piece. So there's revenge and vengeance and a lot of that caught up in their personality. And they feel, keyword, justified. They're justice people. They feel justified. And you talk about king seat. This is a classic king seat person. But some of the people who really got, get caught up in that are not the ones sitting on the throne. They're some of the poorest of the poor who have this incredible chip on their shoulder, who have absolutely no power, but man, they've got this whole vengeance and uh, I, I'll get revenge. I'll never forget that. I'll never forgive. I'll never forget. I mean, they walk around and basically they fall into this king's category. Well, we've said it numerous times today. It's interesting that, that whether you're royalty, literally, or you just operate from the king's seat, I dare say that we all spend some time there. And, and so, uh, again, consider consideration. Uh, if, if I uh, am able to see that, and hopefully we've painted a, a picture that, that makes the uh, thing more obvious, uh, if I'm able to see that, then I need to, to consider where I play into that in my own life. And so, the king has taught us a lesson even in bad behavior. <laughs> Genesis 1, God has created us to rule. He literally said, take charge of the earth, 
have dominion. That's part of our DNA. Part of our spiritual DNA is that we want to be influencers. Put it in language that's popular today. We want to make a difference. Uh, and and uh, uh, that was given up in the garden uh, in, in original sin. But Jesus came back and he took that back. And so we are, we are meant to be rulers. Uh, we're we're and, meant to be influencers. Exactly. We're meant to, to bring positive life. And of course, Jesus put a different spin on it. The greatest of all is the servant of all. So I have the most impact on you when I lay down my life and I become your servant. And, and it's interesting that uh, we need to recognize that uh, outside of, of, of God and Jesus on earth, uh, there's no one that's done it right. Uh, we do things that are right, but that doesn't make us righteous. <laughs> it, it, it's it's a, a practical thing that we're intended for, and yet we, uh, like many things, we use it to our advantage, but when it, when it runs against our, our picture of ourselves, we say, okay, uh, hold on, I, I've got this one. Well, justice people understand authority. They understand the law. They understand application of the law and ideas of fairness. And all of that's important. Knowledge and competency is important. It's a value that God created. Caregiving is important. It's a value that God created. Justice is important. It's a value that God created. But it runs amok when I begin to be a God to you. It's very much like the caregiving. When the caregiver gets into that playing God role, all of a sudden it becomes very unhealthy and it no longer works. Same thing is true here. God is the one who says, I'm the judge, vengeance is mine. When I, as a justice person, begin to try to impose my will, I begin to impose justice on you in a way that is not a governmental justice, and God has designed that. He's designed Romans 13, the, the ruling authorities. But when I start to do that as an individual and lording it over you, I'm into the king's seat in an unhealthy way. Once I get there, if I'm not seeing people respond to my edicts, to, to my high information here, then again, there's pain. That pain begins to cause me to be uh, almost vindictive, vengeful, hateful, controlling, all of these kinds of words, my heart is not in a good place, and I need God at that point. All those positives that you uh, iterated there uh, uh, are, are what is intended. It's, it's, it's what God made us to, to do with and for each other, but in the application uh, or lack of it, uh, we just run contrary to it, and, and damage is done both ways. I'm going to pick up on, in the last segment, I use the word patience. I'm going to pick up on another P word. This segment, I'm going to go to the word perseverance. One of the key issues for the judge, for the justice person, is right now. The Proverbs tell us that if punishment is delayed, if justice is delayed, then everything begins to blow up. It begins to spin off into different circles. So the justice person has a sense of timing. That's very important to them. Not only does this need to happen, it needs to happen now. So many times that ends up being an urgent clock inside of them, and they're pushing this thing and they want this thing to happen in their way and on their timetable, well, not only then do I need patience, I need perseverance. I need to be able to walk this thing out one step at a time, being orderly, being fair, allowing God to do his thing, allowing God to be God. And many times they, they become impatient and or they get into a give-up zone and so having perseverance is another evidence that God has been at work. We're all waiting for Jesus to come again. And uh, uh, we're impatient for it. Uh, do it now. Get us out of here. 
We've, we've suffered enough. But the other side of that story is there are millions, possibly billions of people that still need to receive that gift, that still uh, God is being patient. I, every time I hear a doomsday prophet, prophecy of uh, it's going to happen in such and such a time, and that didn't happen then, or it's going to happen. So, uh, Jesus said, even I don't know. <laughs> if Jesus doesn't know, uh, we're not privy to that. And we should uh, give thanks daily for the fact that God the Father is patient, that he is uh, giving time. It's a wonderful thing. That is a wonderful thing, and the justice person has a hard time with that, so he's wanting to speed this thing up, but in a, a different word actually, I think, really cuts to the heart of it, and it's the word long-suffering. When you begin to understand that the real way justice is established in Scripture is when Jesus came and died, the godly died for the ungodly. Now. The justice person is going to have a problem with that because there's like a belief in punishment that if I just hit you hard enough, you'll learn your lesson and you'll get better. That's why there's a holding out for restitution. I've got to move my faith from that to a long-suffering idea where I begin to understand, again, God loves free will. He wants free will. He wants us to be able to love him. He doesn't want us forced to love him. So now my method of actually reaching out and establishing justice is no longer punishment. It's no longer hit you hard. But God's way of establishing that actually is long-suffering, where Jesus, the just one, laid down his life for those who were sick, who were sinful, who didn't deserve what he did. He paid the penalty so that he could then treat them in whatever manner he needs to treat them. And sometimes that does mean restitution. Sometimes that does mean hammer them a little bit because they're rebels and that's the only thing they understand. But sometimes it also means mercy where he steps back and offers no punishment. In fact, he takes the punishment on himself. That's long suffering. And the justice person doesn't instinctively go into that perseverance, long-suffering place, because it's contrary to everything he thinks and feels. And God doesn't rush because he loves us. He wants all, he will, would want that none would be lost. That, that, that uh, phrase from the Bible has, it comes regularly to me. Uh, when, I, when I get impatient with myself and with others, I, I say to myself, aren't you glad that, that God isn't putting it all on this moment, that, that, that you, you're so angry about uh, whatever you're angry about, and, and he's going to be patient with you and give you opportunity to repent, to uh, see the light, to appreciate the light. It's, it's, it's a, an outstanding uh, an amazing gift that we've been given. And everybody's been given it. Much to our chagrin sometimes, we'd like to think, well, I'm on the right track. But the reality is uh, uh, we deceive ourselves. Patience, perseverance, long-suffering go completely against the grain of the justice person, which I've described. When those kinds of things are showing up, again, where did it come from? Back door, slid in under in a hidden way. When I'm responding that way, if I'm a justice person, God just showed up. Look at our culture right now. Right now, much of what's being put out there in a large way is this whole idea of justice and restitution and making up for it. How much patience do you see? Uh, not so much. There's, there's this fire of do it and do it now. That's normal for a justice person. And when that justice value is being raised up, there is an impatience. 
So when all of a sudden I'm able to do it God's way, and there's a willingness to be long-suffering, and for me to bear the brunt of this thing for a while, and to really be able to interact with you and show love to you, and lay down my life for you, and hope that in a free will basis, you come to a different conclusion, you make a different decision, you grab hold of the values of Christ. See, heart change comes through heart choice. If I hammer you, if I force you, if I bring justice down on your head, and I force you inside of a, the confines of a few behaviors, I may get you to behave a certain way for a little while, but I haven't won your heart. And in the end, that person will rebel and go the opposite direction. The justice person needs long suffering, and he needs, again, the same way we talked about in the first segment and the se second segment, he needs to understand who he is, how he's responding, that it's not in the image of Christ, and repent and begin to actively pray for that. But before that happens, it's probably going to come in as a hidden gift now and then, and hopefully he starts to see it, acknowledge it, and give thanks to God. So the Ten Commandments were given to the Jewish people. Uh, Moses went up on the mountain, met with God. God gave him the Ten Commandments. He took them down, and <laughs> it was a mess. And so he was disgusted with it, and then threw it down. Return with the Ten Commandments. There's this uh, area of thought that that's how we ha are supposed to live. It is how we're supposed to live, but we are not under the law uh, because Jesus died and to show that the law was the standard and that we can't keep it. And the only way it could have been done was God coming down in person and substituting that life for all of our lives. And so, yes, the law matters. It's, it's the standard that we are held to, and rightfully so. But the reality is no one, no one other than Jesus uh, has or ever will be able to live up to that standard. And so Jesus took our place. If we can't, if we don't grasp that, uh, it's go we're going to have our pet point of view that says we are righteous and we're lying to ourselves. If we don't receive, we cannot walk in the manner God has called us to walk. And this whole session today, we've talked about the king seat people are the slowest to recognize their need to receive. God frequently has to come in in a hidden way. He frequently has to come in the back door. When there's a humility and I begin to understand, oh, God is bringing compassion. He is bringing patience. He's bringing a perseverance, a long suffering. He's making me willing to lay down my life for that person that I wanted to make demands on. And we start recognizing God's been here. He's been at work. We give him thanks. We acknowledge him. That is a game changer. That is life changing for the person in the king's seat. And the way he entered was through a manger. Through a manger. That's a back door, all right. If Christ is willing to do that for us, we need to come off from the throne, lay our lives down, and do that for other people. Receiving looks different when you're on the king's seat, but it's still every bit as necessary as when I'm a victim and I've been wounded and I'm hurting. There's still a letting go that needs to happen, and the letting go tends to be faith in self and not faith in God and me my wisdom, I've got to let go of all of that, and I've got to allow God to establish his life in me and through me. And I would offer in, in my closing thought that uh, when life is all about us, it's I'm the center of everything that's going on, we're sitting on the king's throne. Yeah. We've put ourselves there. And how often do we go there? <laughs> Daily. Well, we're wrapping up this whole series on the King's Seat. I hope it's been valuable to you. If it has, share it with some friends. We want to see lives touched. Thank you for being a part of what we do and helping build this message to see lives change, to see effective heart change.